talking about pretty easy stuff today, kind of a physiology type overview. And next on Tuesday or Thursday, we'll start digging into more pathology. Um, this is how I built the class, and of course, you don't need all these books, but it was a major undertaking when I got this class a long time ago. There were no PowerPoint slides for this class when I got it. Um, so let's just review the circulatory system. Um, of course, circulatory system, where's a picture of it? There's a good picture. Uh, this, these are the main pipes and highways of the body. Uh, the main pump is the heart. The heart pumps blood through every nook and cranny of the body uh, through the big vessel, but they get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get into the microcirculation, which is the arterioles, capillaries, and venules. So, yeah, it's like the, it's like the highways, the roads, and stuff that delivers to like Amazon has to go down a big truck and it goes to a <coughs> distribution center it goes down to a smaller truck and then a, a tiny little truck comes to your house so all the cells in your body they need oxygen they need nitrogen they need glucose they need all sorts of stuff to stay stay alive and that stuff is delivered through the circulatory system and plus you have waste that builds up so you have to take that waste away and that is done through the circulatory system it also helps with immunosurveillance if you get a bug going down the highway you have your immune system floating around your grab monocytes for example patrolling uh, and can sound an alarm and rev up the troops to fight the bug so a little bit of immunosurveillance there's actually two members of the circulatory system. There's the cardiovascular system, and there's the lymphatic system. We talk a lot about the cardiovascular system in the first half of this class, the first half of the quarter. So the cardiovascular system has four components. Uh, it has a pulmonary loop or pulmonary system or pulmonary circuit. Of blood vessels going basically to the lungs from the heart to the lungs and back pretty easy easy trip much more complicated trip is the the roads and highways of the systemic system or the systemic loop or whatever you want to call it uh, that's everywhere else except to the lungs so that's all the way down from the heart all the way down to your big toe let's say so it's a long journey um, the main pumps that pump the blood, which carries the nutrients, of course. The main pumps are the heart, but there is a pump in the calf muscle, specifically in the soleus. I don't know if anatomy, in anatomy, if you ever squeeze the soleus muscle, it's kind of spongy-like. It's filled with a honeycomb of veins. And it's when you just are up like I'm up here just kind of swaying back and forth contracting the soleus muscle it squeezes blood up when I take the pressure off the soleus muscle gravity pushes the blood down but what catches the blood so it doesn't go all the way down valves so when I go back on the soleus again the blood goes higher when I go back on this one it comes down it's caught up here so you ratchet the blood out of your lower extremities through the deep system um, so that's important. Uh, it's so important it gets a name. It's called the calf muscle pump system. And then, of course, we have the lungs, which is where all the gas exchange occurs. Carbon dioxide is kicked out, oxygen is taken in, and cells need oxygen to survive. And it's just a cartoon of this short pulmonary loop or pulmonary circuit and this much broader systemic circuit, which goes everywhere else. Uh, so the left side of the heart is much, much larger. You remember that in anatomy. The left heart is pretty muscular. And it's because it has to pump blood all over the place. Uh, and the right heart is pretty wimpy and skinny, but it doesn't have to be very thick because it just has to pump blood to the lungs and, that, and back into the, into the left heart. So uh, the right side of the heart is skinny because of that. But that's a, in a way, it's a bad thing. We'll talk about, we talked about beaver dams yesterday. We're going to really talk about beaver dams today. But if you get a beaver dam of blood flowing into the heart, let's say there's a beaver comes and builds a dam right here. Blood backs up into the lungs. 
and it backs all the way up into the right side of the heart because of Starlin's uh, law and principle, the right side of the heart is going to, to contract much more forcefully to try to beat or try to fight the beaver dam. But the right side of the heart is not designed to do that. So you can be, develop right heart failure much easier than you can left heart failure. Within sometimes months, you can develop right heart failure. Left heart is so strong, it can take years and even decades to develop. So um, it's kind of a bad thing. It's too bad it's not a little bit stronger. All right, just another we looked at this already. Just a picture of the main pipes you learned way back in anatomy. And let's meet the beaver. We kind of met the beaver already. This is a beaver, if you don't know. This is a very famous show I used to watch when I was a little kid back in the 60s. That was the beaver. They called him the beaver because he was always in trouble. And that was what the whole show was. It was called Leave it to Beaver. I don't think, is that on anymore? You guys probably never heard of that show. So you can tell your parents you learned something. Ask them if they remember Leave it to Beaver. And they won. There's a cute little show. Uh, some other important concepts about this beaver dam is the concept of blood flow. Just like a river, blood flows downstream from some reference point. Let's say the heart is the reference point. Blood flows downward and upward away from the heart. So that's called distal. Blood flows distally. Uh, and the, the blood that is up from a reference point up higher, that's proximal to a reference point. A reference point could be an atherosclerotic lesion that's, that's plugged up to the artery. So you, if you reference it, you have a downstream and you have an upstream. And an AK for downstream is distal, meaning like more distant. AK for upstream is proximal. Let's look at a picture. We can go kayaking here to use the picture. So if our reference point is this little rapids, so this would be proximal to the rapids, or we could also say this is a atherosclerotic plaque that's formed and, and caused narrowing of the, let's say the carotid artery by 90%. So upstream would be up here or proximal to the clot. And then downstream would be distal to the clot. Okay, pretty simple stuff. And now we can actually put the, the atherosclerotic plaque, which has resulted in a severe stenosis. Um, this is a heart attack or a stroke waiting to happen. And we'll, we'll explain this process of atherosclerosis. Have you guys already went through that about foam cells? Did Dr. Doe go into that or somebody? A little shaky on that. Yeah, we'll get into that because that's always a board favor. Uh, but in this case, so this would be upstream or, or proximal, and down here would be distal. The blood is flowing this direction. And so the important concept is to note what happens to the blood vessel upstream or proximal from the, we'll just call it a clot for right now, or the narrowing. So the blood platelets are waiting their turn, the blood, uh, red blood cells are waiting their turn to get through this narrowing. They can't go through as normal. So you start to get a backup of blood here, of red blood cells. That also stretches out the blood vessel and puts a lot of pressure on the blood vessel wall. If you have any weakness in the blood vessel wall, maybe of Marfan syndrome, or maybe you have had an old vasculitis injury uh, to this area, that pressure could possibly cause some type of rupture. You could get a bleed uh, because of the increased pressure up here. So that's kind of intuitive. And that backup it can go all, it can it'll keep going and going and going, as we can see. And you can also think of these as little cars in a traffic accident. We've all been in that before. Uh, the traffic, if you get an accident right here and only one car is getting by at a time, you get a massive backup, right? And it can go into the side streets and it can go everywhere. It's the same, it's the same process. And then all the extra cars on the road start to push the blood vessels out. So same type of concept. I will use that beaver dam thing over and over and over again. So that's the concept of the beaver dam. And that's everything that I just said. The other thing that's important on these beaver dams, um, have you, I know we've all done this, have you taken a hose, a garden hose, and put your finger over it? 
What happens to the initial water coming out? It comes flying out. But did you ever measure the volume of the water coming out? It's actually decreased. So the initial, what is it, maybe five yards or 10 yards, you get a blast of high pressure blood coming out, but the overall volume of blood is still low. That pressure, that blast, if it hits the side of the uh, of an artery, it can also start to damage the artery to the point the artery could rupture. And that's another problem that can happen with dissecting aneurysms, which we'll talk about when the time comes. So just remember, even though the decrease, there's a decrease in overall volume of blood, um, there is a little spray that comes out. And if it happens to come out in a weird angle and it hits the wall uh, of the vessel, it can damage the wall to the point it could eventually rupture and you could bleed out really quick. All right, so that's the beaver dam. Um, I'll talk about the microcirculation. Just to remind you who the microcirculation is, capillaries have to be, those are the smallest vessels, but the microcirculation is also arterioles and venules. Um, those guys are important as well. They're very, very muscular and there's, they have a tunica media that's very thick. Uh, and therefore the body can control uh, the tightness of that tunica media. If you contract the tunica media, what happens to the blood flow through that vessel? Does it decrease or increase? It decreases, right? If you contract the, here's a blood vessel lumen. If you contract the walls, the lumen size decreases and you can't get blood flow in there. If you relax the tunica media, the smooth muscle, it pops open and blood can flow more easily through that. Um, arterioles are the main controller of blood pressure. Venules are right beside, they have a ton, their tunica media is really powerful. All right, so those are the, that's the microcirculation. Arteries are under high pressure, of course, because blood flies out of the heart under much higher pressure, travels in arteries. Uh, they have stronger walls, but the large vessels, the walls are still quite stretchy. And we talked about that yesterday in the lab where we had, this is the heart right here. And we had the ascending aorta and the aortic arch going around. Uh, and we said that when systole occurs, the, the ascending aorta stretches out like crazy. When diastole occurs, there's no pressure, so it snaps back and it pushes blood through the, through the body. That's why you always are have a flow of blood all the time, but it also pushes blood backwards. Semilunar valves pop open so you don't regurgitate into the into the ventricles. So the arteries are quite elastic, especially the big ones. And that's everything I said about how that elastic recoil pushes, propels blood uh, while your heart is napping during diastole. That's why when you cut yourself, blood always comes out. But it, you cut an artery, what happens? spurts right so it's it's not a constant flow it's still uh, the pressure still higher during systole but even though during diastole you still have pressure and why because of that elastic recoil okay arterioles again several there's like five different subdivisions of arterioles we won't worry about that but they get smaller and smaller they dive into muscles they dive into organs they dive into your eye um, they, they, and they get smaller and smaller, almost to the point they're the same size of the capillary. But they have a very strong muscular wall, as I said, and therefore they, um, you, you have great control over the luminal size. And therefore you have control over the capillaries, because the capillaries are immediately downstream from the arterioles and venules. So you can control the flow of blood through the capillaries by adjusting the arterioles. Does that, do capillaries have a tunica media? Can you, can you regulate the size of the capillaries? Nostalgia question, I see head shaking, you are correct. There is no tunica media in capillaries. It's just an endothelial layer uh, with some cells, some endothelial cells and a little bit of tissue underneath. That's why it's so easy to, to dump nutrients and stuff, stuff out of the capillaries. A lot of times you don't even need transporters that, they can just dump right into the uh, into the what? What's on the other side of the capillary? So we have blood on one side of the, of the endothelium of the wall of the capillary. We have blood. What's on the other side? Interstitium. Excellent. The interstitium. And then who sits in the interstitium? 
cells. Yep, you got it. That's exactly where we're going to. Um, so everything I said, the arterial, uh, the control blood flow by regulating the size of the lumen, decrease the lumen, increases blood pressure. Increase the lumen, decreases blood pressure. Uh, and they're constantly being adjusted by the body because the capillaries, they always want to have the same pressure. The body will go at great lengths to have the capillary pressure, the hydrostatic pressure be just right. And you're constantly adjusting for that. Um, capillaries, of course, are, you could say they're between the arterioles and venules. Or a more general question, they're between the arterial and the venous systems. Another member of the microcirculation, they're the smallest type of vessel you can have. They're super important because this is where the feeding of the body cells comes from and the removal of waste. You do not feed the body cells through arterioles and venules. It's only through capillaries. Arterioles and venules can't, can't distribute oxygen and they can't collect waste. Only the capillaries can do that. There are three types of capillaries with varying degree of leakiness. Let's look at them. Just to, I could throw a question. I guess I have thrown some questions in here. From leaky to, or from not, from stingy to really leaky, we have continuous capillaries. And then on the other side, we have discontinuous capillaries, sometimes called sinusoidal capillaries. But I always remember continuous because the, the endothelial cells that make the continuous capillaries, they're like one. They're continuous with each other. They're pushed so close together, it's like one big cell. So they're continuous. If they're discontinuous, the walls between the endothelial cells, they're not continuous. They're, they have holes between them. Uh, and they're super, super leaky. And then we have these weird fenestrated capillaries, which are medium leaky. These are the ones in your kidneys and in your intestine. They're called fenestrated. I always think of little fencers. These guys have been fencing and they poked holes in them. So I just picture, I remember this picture, fener, fen, fenestrated capillaries, fencing. Um, the muscles have these continuous capillaries, the nervous system, um, and the really leaky ones are in the bone marrow where red blood cells are made. They have to, you have to be able to get the stuff that's made in the bone marrow into the blood real easily. So we have gigantic holes between the endothelial cells which make these capillaries. Uh, let's see, yep, they're leaky because there is no tunica media, only a thin tunica intima. Um, and they can be, can they can be completely turned off? Do you have capillaries in your body right now that are completely off? You can shunt, away from you can shunt but you can completely turn, you can completely narrow them, completely shut them off. Uh, people who are bleeding, in, in fact, a blood vessel five millimeters or lower can be completely pinched off by the tunica media. So arterioles can be completely turned off in emergency situations. So yes, they can be turned off and that's how our core is regulated uh, if you're if you're super 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 hot uh, and you need to remove heat from the body you can pop open all the capillaries in your skin uh, and you can get rid of heat that way that's that's also is that stressful on the heart for older people people with heart conditions who live in hot and humid weather and all these yeah the heart has to push blood through many more miles of of streets and roads uh, and it is harder there's way more incidence of heart attacks when a heat wave sweeps over uh, the country with people without air conditioning and okay yep and it can be turned off uh, if you're bleeding to death it can be turned off as well uh, by the r2a system it can be engaged and it'll shut off the capillaries to the skin and muscles because it, if you don't have enough blood to keep your brain and your liver and your heart going, you're not going to make it. So the body will shut off the skin and muscles to, to divert blood into the, the, the core, so to speak. Um, so people at an accident scene, it's always a bad sign to see their skin all pale and green and cold. 
uh, not a good thing because that means probably the endothelial or the R2A system is turned on and they got to bleed somewhere and their body's trying to conserve blood because they're leaking blood like crazy. Uh, let's not forget our friends, the lymph capillaries. So uh, lymph capillaries are dead-ended. They're a blind-ended tube. They're not a continuous tube like our regular capillaries. Blood comes in one end, goes out the other. Not true with the lymph system. Lymph capillaries are always entangled within capillaries. They don't, authors don't draw them that much, but they're really important. Uh, so everywhere you have a capillary, you have a lymph capillary that is entangled with it. Uh, and their main job is to help siphon off the extra blood fluid that is driven out in the proximal part of the capillary. Uh, the distal capillary, of course, we'll go over this in a second more, the distal capillary reabsorbs blood fluid and it needs help. The lymph system, lymph capillaries help drain off the, the blood fluid that's driven out through the proximal capillaries. Um, and as long as everything is functioning, you don't swell. What if our little beaver swims right in here and blocks this lymph vessel? What happens to all the skin? It swells like crazy because the distal capillary, which would be down in here, this is where the extra blood fluid or interstitial fluid um, that that's constantly circulating. It has to be picked up here and here by these two. And if one of these is taken down, you're going to swell like crazy. And we'll hit that again more when we get, when we talk about swelling. So lymph capillaries are really important as well. And might as well do the interstitium. You can look at this cartoon more closely and you can see all the cells and the cells just don't sit in nothing. They sit very similar to the nucleus propulsus of the disc. They sit in a proteoglycan gel, and that's called the interstitium. And that's constantly being replenished with really blood. It's blood fluid. Blood fluid is really interstitial fluid. Uh, but interstitial fluid is constantly uh, being held in a proteoglycan gel here. But it's constantly replenishing. Blood fluid comes out here of the proximal capillary and it's returned here. I think I got another slide in that we can look at. But yeah, the interstitium, it's made up of a lot of proteoglycan molecules. Remember those things? They have a core protein. Glycosaminoglycans are connected to a core protein. And that thing is like a sponge. It absorbs water like crazy. Uh, and that's what the interstitium is filled with these proteoglycans. Um, yep, said this already. So water from the interstitium comes from the proximal capillary because of the high hydrostatic pressure. Um, and that is called, you can call it blood fluid, you can call it water. You shouldn't call it interstitial fluid, uh, but it's the, you shouldn't really call, them, call it serum either, but it's really the blood serum in a way you could think of it. Uh, but it's the watery component. Blood is mostly water. So it's, that's why it's best to call it the blood fluid or blood water. That is your interstitial fluid. And that is driven out. Where's this classic? Here's the classic diagram. So the capillary hydrostatic pressure is super important. It's 30 millimeters of pressure at the proximal capillary in this little cartoon. It drops to 10 millimeters in the distal part of the capillary. And then we have this other force. And this, this hydrostatic pressure is a pushing force. It's pushing water, glucose, nitrogen. It's pushing things out of this super leaky, thin capillary. But there is a sucking force called the oncotic force or oncotic pressure, or colloid osmotic pressure. They're all the same. Um, and that pressure is always the same. It does, unless you've been burned or unless you have histamine release, um, it's always the same. And it patiently waits. At the proximal capillary, the oncotic pressure is way too powerful for it. So water, blood, fluid is driven out into the interstitium and glucose and all the nutrients. But this drops, the hydrostatic pressure drops, and pretty soon the oncotic pressure is more powerful. And the sucking force can now start to return the interstitial fluid back into the distal part of the capillary here, as well as wastes. 
uh, that have built up. Um, and so this is the this has been around forever. And then I always get asked, well, what about the new Starling principles and the new Starling laws, where there's a glycocalyx covering and interacting with all this this stuff, this blood fluid? Um, this principle still holds true. It's just way more complicated, but it still holds true that interstitial fluid is dumped out of the blood, or blood fluid becomes interstitial fluid, and the excess is reabsorbed here. So don't worry, I'm not getting into the new starting stuff because it's not even in the board books yet. But that principle still holds true. And so once all this blood fluid is dumped in here, we have... We have some of it drained off here, but the lymph capillary is very important for draining off the, right, the rest of it. And as long as you have a good lymph capillary and a good distal capillary to drain this stuff away, you're not gonna swell and your tissue will be neutral. But if you beaver dam the lymph capillary up from maybe cancer, maybe you've got cancer and cancer cells have gotten in here and are clogging up this pipe, you're gonna swell. One of the first signs of some types of cancer might be the general swelling over the body because of that. Or bugs can get sucked in here and start causing inflammation. Any type of blockage will cause swelling. Okay, so hopefully you guys remember that. You guys usually do. I had to ask a question or two. I've asked us quite a few stars on here. Everybody good with that? Pretty basic stuff. Okay. Um, yep, so sir, this is some fun facts from Guyton. Fit the, the word of moving across that membrane is called filtration across the capillary. It's accomplished by hydrostatic pressure and colloid osmotic pressure. By the way, what causes this sucking force? Why is there a sucking force? Who's responsible for that? Albumin, very good. The big giant molecule that's floating through our bloodstream. It's like the moon. The moon has a gravity pulling on the earth uh, we can't really, it doesn't really affect us. It affects the tides though, right? We know what's there. So albumin is like a moon flo floating through the capillaries and it has a sucking force to try to suck on the interstitium and help get it back up. And there's other capillaries, fibrin, and there's other proteins that help. But albumin is the big, the big dog. What happens if you get burned really badly and these capillaries are destroyed? and albumin is leaking out into the interstitial because normally albumin can't get out, right? It can't get into the, the, the nephron, it can't get anywhere. It's too big. But what happens if you get burned really bad? Severely, yeah. You Burn victims really swell like crazy. We'll cover that more. But why do they swell? Because you've lost the moon, you've lost that, that oncotic force and there's nothing to pull the interstitial fluid out. Okay, same with histamine. If you get an allergy to a cat or something and it gets in your eyes and you get it on your hands and you scratch your eyes, histamine pops these, uh, these capillaries open uh, and makes them, it makes the cells shrink and it pulls the walls apart. So too much blood fluid is dumped in and what happens to your eyes? They get all puffy. And it's because of this, this same type of principle. Okay. Uh, what else here are the fun facts? We knew we know nutrients are pushed out. Waste is pulled in the distal capillary. Um, these pushing and pulling forces are called starling forces. All right. More fun facts about the interstitium. It's 90, 99% uh, of this blood fluid or blood water is held within the proteoglycan gel. 1% is free to kind of circulate between the proximal and distal capillaries. Um, and it clumps together in things called rivulets. People who swell, that can get up to 30, 40% of rivulets. Swelling and pitting edema is caused by this free water buildup because it can't be siphoned off fast enough. Uh, capillaries don't connect directly to cells. That's, I threw that on the test, so I surprised people missed that. The capillaries don't plug into cells. They just dump into the interstitium and then the nutrients have to swim through the interstitium to feed the cell. So there's no direct connection. Okay, venules. So that is very, they're similar to arterioles. Those are after capillaries dump into venules. 
If you wanted to go into the weeds, there's about five different subtypes of venules as well, which I'm not going to go into the weeds on that. I used to go into the weeds a long time ago, but I don't need to. Um, they do not have valves. A lot of veins have valves, but you need a bigger caliber uh, vein to have a valve. Um, and they push the blood into progressively larger and larger veins. We know that. Uh, the venules are very muscular as well, not quite as muscular as arterioles, uh, but they can um, they can control help control blood pressure by by uh, decreasing the size of the lumen because they can contract the tunica media. Veins in general, uh, they transport deoxygenated blood. Where's the where's the who breaks the rule? What vein transports oxygenated blood? Pulmonary veins, pulmonary veins. So vein and an artery, arteries always leave or come toward the heart. Arteries always leave the heart, veins always come back. And that system is embedded in stone. It doesn't care whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated. That's why the pulmonary veins that go to the right or go to the left atrium, what kind of blood is in the pulmonary veins? It's oxygenated. So watch out for those little softball board questions. Can't miss those things. Uh, veins are very stretchy, more stretchy than arteries. And that stretchy, of course, that's not really a good term for it. Stretchiness is compliance, is stretchiness. Um, and they have the ability to hold great volumes of blood. So that's called capacitance. So veins have high capacitance and high compliance, and some have valves, especially in the lower extremities. Do the upper extremity veins have valves? Couple, they're not very many though, uh, but the lower extremity has a lot. Anything that's against gravity has developed valves, including, you remember the gonadal testicular ovarian veins? You remember those way back from first quarter? We're going to come back to those in guys because there's a connection with BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, connection between uh, valves, valve problems. Okay, so usually we take a break at this point. I'm about halfway through. So we stretch our legs, do a lap, and then we'll come back and finish this off. Did you want to find an activator? Sorry, Oh, no. No? Okay, thank you. <laughs> 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 And you guys who came in late, make sure you get on, go on the website and go on uh, virtual classroom on the meeting so I can get you on attendance. I think some of you have or haven't. Okay. Yeah. No attendance sheet. It's online. There is. There is. I'm still thinking about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I will do that. Okay, I just left it open, so you should be able to log on.
If they want that two hours to like, maybe Dr. Jay is cool with us. Is it today? Yeah, I got three. I don't know, Say that now. Do we feel like it's hard? I don't know. I do remember it's very straightforward. So I didn't have one practical look. I like this. 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 That's true. Time and pain. Yeah, time and pain. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's All right, whoops, let me get the slides back up. All right, we're talking about veins. We said that they have high capacitance and high compliance. You have a lot of blood stored in your veins right now, especially with seated. But if a tiger comes running into the room, the sympathetics go off. There's enough tunica media in veins to cause a massive vasoconstriction and send a huge glob of blood heading into the heart, which stretches the heart. The heart responds by squeezing that blood through the lungs and into the left heart. Uh, therefore, you're fighting flight. You're ready to fight the tiger or try to run away from the tiger. So that wouldn't be possible without capacitance. Okay, the large ones, yeah, the large, like the vena cava, they don't control blood pressure. They have tunica media, but it's not, it can contract a little bit, but they don't have a lot of capacitance either. It's the medium-sized veins that really store a lot of the blood. They're under progressively lower pressure. Blood leaves at about 140 pressure millimeters of mercury. Uh, it leaves the aorta. It comes back through the venous system. By the time it hits the right atrium, it's only four millimeters of mercury. So there's barely any pressure there at all. Uh, Two-sided heart. I talk about right heart and left heart. When I say the left heart, I'm talking collectively about the left atrium and the left ventricles. That's what that means. Um, of course, the left heart drives the systemic loop. The right heart drives the pulmonary loop. Here are the parts of the heart, which I assume you know. If you don't know this, you should go over this because you'll get lost when I'm lecturing 
I just assume you know this stuff, but just quickly, we'll do this again when we start the heart, but remember the blood dumps into the right atrium through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Are there valves here? Are there any valves between the superior vena cava and the right atrium? No, there's no valves, um, which is going to, well, we'll show you what happens because there are, are no valves in a minute here. Uh, but so blood goes through, what's this first valve called? Let's see, it says tricuspid. It must be the tricuspid valve. Uh, and then during systole, it blasts out the pulmonary trunk through the pulmonic valve or pulmonary valve. We don't call them the semilunar valves ever in pathology. The only time you call them semilunar valves, if you want to talk about them together, then you could say the semilunar valves. But if you're talking about them individually, it's the aortic valve or the pulmonic valve. So blood goes up the pulmonary trunk. Sometimes this is called in pathology just the pulmonary artery. Not a right, not a left, just the pulmonary artery. Sometimes it's called that. And then it splits into a right and left pulmonary artery, goes into the lungs, drops off carb CO2, picks up oxygen, comes back to the left atrium via four pipes, the superior and inferior pulmonary veins, um, and that dumps into the left atrium. Atrial systole occurs. It goes through this valve. That's called the mitral valve. We never call that the bicuspid valve in pathology. It's always the mitral valve. You only hear bicuspid in anatomy. Uh, and then the powerful left ventricle fills up with blood, and blood is shot up the ascending aorta uh, through this very important valve. That's the aortic valve. And it goes around the horn, the aortic arch. It's got its takeoffs there, brachiocephalic trunk. What's this one? What's the middle one? Ooh, that's going way back, isn't it? You knew this at one time, the left common carotid. And then this one, left subclavian. And then once it, once it blood passes this right here, the left subclavian, that's the descending aorta or the thoracic aorta. This is also called the isthmic region. If you really want to go into the weeds, it has a special name, but we'll, we'll look at that a little later on. That's pretty much the flow of blood through the heart, which I assume you know. Uh, can the heart become a beaver dam? Yeah, we said the heart can become a beaver dam. Uh, and if it doesn't pump, let's go to my wonderful drawing. Let's look at the better drawing first. This is like the Dr. Doe drawing. So beautiful heart. Uh, and then we have blood going into the lungs. They kind of just made two pipes to keep it simple. Now let's go to the Dr. Jiller drawing. There's the Dr. Jiller drawing. This is why I don't draw. But it still kind of gets the job done. Because if you have, the blood is flowing through the left side of the heart and out to the body. The blood is coming back through the superior and inferior vena cave into the right heart. Um, so if you have any type of a beaver dam in the left heart, if there's a tumor growing in the left ventricle, if the aortic valve has gotten stuck and won't open, aortic stenosis, that will not let blood out of the heart. If the heart is just failing and it doesn't beat enough, that's going to not be able, the heart won't be able to process blood. Anything that decreases the ability for the, for the heart to take blood in and get blood out, it's going to cause, it's going to act like a beaver dam or a traffic crash. And you're going to get blood backing up first into the lungs. What's going to happen to the lungs if blood's starting to back up in here? What's going to happen to the pressure in the lungs? Up or down? Definitely up. So you're going to get pulmonary hypertension. In fact, the pressure, if it gets high enough, will start to spill into the microcirculation around the alveoli. If the pressure starts to get too high, too much blood fluid is going to be driven into the alveoli, and you're going to start to cough and choke. You're going to have blood fluid going into the alveoli. So that's called pulmonary congestion. So a beaver dam in the left heart causes pulmonary hypertension uh, and pulmonary congestion. And then the effect keeps right on going. The left heart is starting to feel this blood backing up. Or I'm sorry, the right heart is now feeling this, that 
there's a backup and the pressure is increasing and it starts to go, oh my God, we're, we're, we're getting backed up. We better pump harder. And it tries to pump harder to push blood through the beaver dam. And that only raises the blood pressure because you can only get so much through here and it wrecks the right side of the heart. And then the, the beaver dam water, the backed up water or the traffic, the accidents, the cars, it keep it go it leaves the heart and it goes up the jugular the external jugular vein and their veins start to bulge in your neck and you can physically see this and we'll look at Kuzmal's sign when the time comes and then it keeps right going down the inferior vena cava and the blood backs up into the liver and the liver starts swelling and you get hepatomegaly the liver starts swelling up with blood and there's a test you could take your fingers and poke the bottom of the liver and drive the blood into the right heart, which can't accept any more blood. That drives blood up into the external jugular vein, and the, you could literally poke the liver and make the jugular veins bug out in people who've got, who have some kind of a beaver dam along this pathway. We'll look at that when the time comes. And it's, we're not over. The blood can keep backing right up, and it can go through the portal system. Remember, there's two big veins going into the liver. There's the inferior vena cava, and then there's the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein will take the, the superior vena cava back, or inferior vena cava backup blood, and it'll start going that way, and it'll go right into the liver via the splenic vein. The liver, or the, sorry, the spleen, and the spleen starts to swell up to the point you can palpate it, and you get splenomegaly. And then it goes right down into, remember all those intestinal veins and arteries way back? And I think that was gross too. Um, those things can fill up with blood and start leaking into the peritoneal cavity. So you can get blood fluid, not leaking into the alveoli, but leaking into this giant cavity. So you can get ascites from this, from a beaver dam in the heart. And it can go right down into the feet and the feet, the ankles can swell up because of a failed heart as well. And so you get a gigantic backup, all because you have some kind of blockage of the flow of blood through the left heart. And it doesn't have to be the left heart. What if you get a beaver dam in the, let's say the pulmonary trunk, you get an embolism stuck there. The same thing, your left heart will be okay, but everything upstream will be affected. So any beaver dam in this system right here can cause your feet to swell. See how that works? Okay, and that's just everything I said, and that's everything I said you can read about, and that's the beaver dam. And here is a patient um, who, how does his jugular veins look? Have you ever seen that before? Does that look normal? That's definitely not normal. So he has mitral stenosis really bad, uh, and that's the beaver dam. The heart is acting as a beaver dam. Specifically, the aortic valve is an opening can't get blood shooting out the heart, so it backs up in that same story. His liver will be swollen, his spleen will be swollen, he'll have cites, his, he'll have fluid in his belly, and his ankles will probably be swollen as well, all because of mitral stenosis. And that is called the Kuzmol sign. The Kuzmol sign, you would just have him take a breath. What happens when you take a breath, of blood, or take a breath in? What happens to blood coming into the heart? Does it increase or decrease or no change? Increases, right? What happens to the pressure in your chest when you take a deep breath? Negative. It becomes very negative, like a vacuum, and it sucks blood, it sucks stomach fluid, it sucks everything in uh, through the vessels. So you, when you take a breath, you suck blood into the heart, and if there's no room for the blood, because you have a beaver dam somewhere, it just goes right up into, up into the jugular veins here, and they bug out like crazy, and that's a cool small sign. Blood vessel wall, I assume you know this stuff. The tunica adventitia is the outer layer. Tunica media is the muscular middle layer. Tunica intima is the middle layer. All right, watch out for the AKAs. Tunica intima, um, tunica interna is an AKA. Uh, same with the adventitia layer. Tunica externa is an AKA you have to watch out for. There's a nice picture of it. The other thing I should mention, I don't think I said, is this an artery or a vein? 
And how can you tell? Who likes Swiss cheese? I love Swiss cheese. There's two Swiss cheese layers in arteries uh, called the external and internal elastic Swiss cheese, or no, it doesn't say that, uh, lamina. Internal and external lamina, or laminae for plural. Veins don't have those. And we don't exactly understand why they're there because they have giant holes, so they're certainly not going to stop things from getting through. Uh, but the theory is it's because of the high pressure of arteries. We've just evolved two strong layers here. Um, so gives it the wall of extra strength. Now remember when I say tunica intima, the tunica intima is made up of three layers itself. The important one is this endothelial layer, which is made up of just squamous cells, simple squamous. And then they sit on a basement membrane called the basal lamina. Basal lamina sits on the subendothelial layer. Not very important, but um, it's good to know the tunica intima is actually three layers. And the one we always talk about is the endothelium, which is made up of endothelial cells, which are just simple squamous cells. So let's look at those because a lot of disease occurs with these cells. They're found everywhere, endothelial cells. It even lines the heart, the inside of the heart. Uh, it's called the endocardium, but it, they're the exact same cells. They do the exact same thing. Well, they do a, one thing a little different. They secrete anti or the um, ANF hormone. So they're a little different, but basically they're the same thing. Um, histologically speaking, I already said they're, these endothelial cells are really nothing more than simple squamous epithelium. That's how they're classified. No one calls them that. I guess you could call them the simple squamous epithelium of the vessels, but that's way too long. It's better just to say endothelial cells, but they're the same thing. Um, they, there's a bunch of it, depending on how big the vessel is. Uh, there may be several of them that connect on the sides to form the lumen of the vessel. Capillaries are so small, one endothelial cell wraps around in a circle shape and the tiniest capillaries are formed by one endothelial cell. Your aorta probably has hundreds of endothelial cells creating the lumen, all wrapping around to do it. Okay, the luminal surface, when I say luminal surface, it's this surface right here that is touching the blood. That's the luminal surface. Um, it has a bunch of stuff on the top, coming out the top of the cells. Uh, some of this stuff is really important, like insulin receptors, receptors that will grab the molecule of insulin and pull it inside, histamine receptors, which will grab histamine floating through the blood and pull it inside the cell. And importantly for pathology, there's LDL receptors, low density lipoprotein receptors that are tasting the blood, they're flapping back and forth in the blood, waiting for an, endo, uh, waiting for an LDL molecule to come by, and it grabs onto it, pulls it inside the cell, and takes it apart, uses some of it. Thank goodness we're not in biochemistry, but there's, if anybody wants to look at what an endothelial receptor looks like, that's it. Here's the inside, the cytosol of the cell. Here's the blood flowing out here, and I don't need you to know that for me, but you should definitely know what a, uh, an LDL receptor is. It yeah, grabs LDLs, pulls them inside. How does it, there's a word for that. It's called endocytosis is the mechanism by which it pulls the LDL cell inside. And the LDL can be disassembled and some of it is useful, some of it is destroyed. What about a mutation? What if you're, there's somebody in this room, there's probably two, three of you in this room right now who have a slight mutation in the gene that makes these LDL receptors. And what if your LDL receptor isn't the greatest at grabbing LDL? What's your blood chemistry going to look like? How are your LDL levels going to be when you get your blood tested? They're going to be high. What about your cholesterol levels? Does cholesterol have anything to do with LDL? Yep. Who rides inside of the LDL molecule? Cholesterol. A lot of cholesterol. Some cholesterol floats free through the blood. 
most cholesterol is packaged inside LDL molecule. And if LDL is not pulled inside your cell, it just floats around in the bloodstream banging into the walls and it can break open and dump all that cholesterol loose. And you get too much free cholesterol. And so almost always if you have elevated LDL levels, you're going to have elevated cholesterol levels as well. It's actually the cholesterol is always more famous, but that's not the one to really worry about. It's the LDL levels that is important. And yep, everything I said. And yeah, if you have mutations, and they don't have to be full mutations, just partial mutations, and your LDL receptors aren't the greatest, you're going to have conditions like hypercholesterolemia. Let's break that down. What's hyper mean? Too much or elevated cholesterol is cholesterolemia, condition of the blood. So too much cholesterol in the blood. Hyperlipoproteinemia is too many LDLs floating around in the blood. Why cholesterol? We already said. There's an LDL molecule, and you can see that packaged inside is tons of cholesterol in its storage form, cholesterol esters. There's triglycerides. Therefore, people with high LDL levels almost always have high triglyceride levels. Those are also packaged inside. So these LDLs are little fat bombs. It's good to try to get these out of the blood as soon as possible. And everything I said, if you have a mutation and they're broken, you can't pull the cholesterol and LDLs inside and they float around and can be very mischievous. Who knows what 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 is the start of atherosclerosis? How does it start? Who's the culprit? It's LDLs. LDLs are the culprit. Uh, those LDLs, if they're not pulled inside the, the endothelial cell to get rid of them, they float around the blood and they look for damage in the, uh, in the endothelial lining. If two cells are pulled apart, the LDL can sneak right between the endothelial cells and get underneath the endothelial cells. And the body sees them and all hell breaks loose get a wicked inflammation, and that is the start of atherosclerosis. No LDL problem, no atherosclerosis. That always starts via LDLs, getting through the endothelium. And we will go over that. And then the end process, here's atherosclerosis. Not everybody goes this extreme with the process of atherosclerosis. Oops. Um, but you can form these giant bumps in the in the vessel wall, and those are called plaques. And probably 90% of heart attacks occur when this plaque breaks open. Uh, and if it breaks open within minutes, you'll get a blood clot forming right here. And it'll, any blood flow downstream is now shut off. If that happens in your heart, you're going to have a heart attack. If that happens in your brain, you're going to have a stroke. So it all comes back to those little LDL molecules and the LDL receptors. And that is enough for today. Now here's your bird for the day. So I always give you one easy question. The bird question won't be hard. So 99.9% .9 of you will get the bird question right. If you don't come to class, you might, like if you don't even come to online class and just study the slides, you might miss the bird question. This is a common yellow throat. So if you see this on the test, does it have a yellow throat? You can't miss it, right? If I put a red-tailed hawk, I had somebody call this a red-tailed hawk. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. I've had some crazy answers. So common yellow throat. All right, here we go. It is cardiovascular pathology day. Pulmonary pathology won't be for a long time after the midterm. And it is Thursday. It is week one. It is the spring of 2022. Here we go. So we're talking about blood vessels. We talked about the, the three layers of the blood vessel, the tunica intima, meaning inside, tunica media, M for muscle. That's the middle layer of a blood vessel wall. Tunica adventitia is for outside. The A is kind of like an O outside 
layer. And we talked about endothelial cells, which are simple squamous is their classification. But now let's get into the function of these amazing endothelial cells. We also said that they have a bunch of receptors on the luminal side that are kind of flowing inside the blood. And we talked about an LDL receptor, how important it was that those aren't mutated because if LDLs aren't taken out of the blood by these receptors, they can build up. They can get through cracks between endothelial cells and cause an inflammation of blood vessels. And that's a process called atherosclerosis, which can clog up the blood vessel and cause all sorts of trouble. But let's look at some more functions of these endothelial cells. Um, they're very busy. They secrete all sorts of different biomolecules, collagens, type 2, 4, and 5, which are needed to, uh, to make repairs to the basement membrane and other things underneath. Laminin, prostacyclin is one of the slippery three. Uh, that's a molecule that prevents blood from thrombosing or clotting. You shouldn't really say clotting, but that makes more sense to people. Prevents blood from clotting on the luminal surface, which can be very deadly. Uh, endothelin, uh, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor, can narrow the lumen, narrow the flow of blood through the blood vessel. And then nitric oxide does just the opposite increases the flow of blood through the blood vessel. And then we have von Willebrand factor, uh, which is a member of the blood clotting cascade. So we'll get into these molecules. And the endothelial cells have some very important enzymes attached to them as well. You're familiar with ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which of course uh, takes angiotensin 1 and converts it into the Tasmanian devil, angiotensin II, which has all kinds of bio biological effects in the body. Some of them are evil. There is another enzyme called ACE2. Why there's no ACE1, I have no idea. But there's an ACE2. I'm sure there probably is, but it's not really clinically important. Uh, but ACE2's job that I assume you know, ACE2 grabs that, sometimes evil angiotensin 2 and converts it into a an, a molecule called angiotensin 1 7 which has wonderful properties like it lowers your blood pressure uh, it prevents blood clotting it does just the opposite that angiotensin 2 does so i, I signed marshall dillon is an old 60s cowboy sheriff hero type guy so that's angiotensin 1 7 i have youtube videos on these back when I used to do that in endocrinology. I've taken a lot of that out because the new physiology professor is doing so good, I can finally free up and focus more on pathology. So yeah, the other key about ACE2, ACE2 is what SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes COVID-19. ACE2 is what SARS-CoV-2 binds to. <clears throat> Anybody see a problem with that? Well, if, if ACE2 is all clogged up with SARS-CoV-2, it's not available to siphon off angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 2 levels build up in the blood, and they cause all kinds of trouble, like blood clotting. Um, they cause scar tissue formation in the heart, so they can ruin the heart. Um, so a whole bunch of bad stuff happens. Uh, raise your blood pressure. Uh, um, so that SARS-CoV-2 is a monster. Endothelial cells collectively form a barrier, a, a selectively permeable barrier, so make it hard for large molecules like red blood cells and bugs to get out of the bloodstream. Um, so that's important. Uh, tight junctions, of course, are between endothelial cells, and they prevent leakage, and they prevent molecules from getting in and out as well. And if something's going to leak, it's probably at the capillary level. Remember, the capillaries are only have one layer for the most part, uh, a endothelial layer, and they have very thin tunic adventitia. Um, how do molecules get across endothelium? There's three ways, really four ways. Simple diffusion, active transport, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and through fenestration sometimes. Remember, that's those are medial 
medium leaky arteries we, or capillaries, which we talked about last time. All right, then endothelial cells also secrete some non-stick molecules, which are called non-thrombogenic. Thrombo means the f blood clot formation or thrombosis formation. Genic means, yeah, they do that. So blood, uh, so they secrete three. I call them the slippery three. Uh, they're very important because they prevent blood clots from forming. They, specifically, they prevent platelets from sticking together. And it's not good uh, when things stick together because that causes thrombus, which again is kind of like a blood clot, commonly known, but it's not. Blood clotting occurs outside of a blood vessel. Um, so the, pr the problem with blood clots, not only can they narrow the flow of blood through the blood vessel, but they can also f break loose. If a piece of the thrombosis breaks loose, uh, a big chunk of it's floating downstream and can get stuck in bad places and cause ischemia. Uh, that, that piece that breaks loose is called an embolus. If it happens in the veins, that ends up in the lungs usually. So it's called a pulmonary embolism. If it happens in an artery, let's say you have atrial fibrillation and it happens in the left atrium, it can go anywhere. It can go up into the brain and cause a cerebral embolism. Um, it can go into the kidney, cause a renal embolism. See how that works. All right, so the lumen has to be kept slippery by these anticoagulant molecules or antithrombogenic is an AK for that. So who are the slippery three? The toilet papers, the mnemonic I use for that. So thrombomodulin, tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, and the king of them is something called prostacyclin. I always think of somebody on a bicycle is moving fast, and that keeps the blood moving fast. So prostacyclin, pro means yes, go. Cyclin means riding your bike, so it, it keeps the blood moving fast. So these are the slippery three. All of these are secreted by endothelial cells. What about endothelial cell injury? If endothelial cells get injured and upset and inflamed, um, they do some bad stuff. Uh, specifically, that can put the body in a prothrombogenic state, which increases the risk for thrombosis, which increases the risk for embolisms. Um, it also causes atherogenesis if these blood uh, endothelial cells get injured. Uh, that's our, the formation of atherosclerosis, is atherogenesis. And we talked about that last time where the endothelial cells get broken up or loosened up and the LDLs can sneak between the endothelial cells and get into the wall of the blood vessel where an inflammation starts. And that can weaken the blood vessel to the point it can pop and cause an aneurysm, a bulging, and then a popping, which is a hemorrhage. And it can also cause a stenosis of the blood vessel because of the plaque formation involved. And we'll talk about that in the future. Um, so let's talk some more about this endothelial cell injury. What may injure the endothelial cells? Well, chronic hypertension, either primary or secondary. What's primary hypertension? What's the cause of primary hypertension? We have no clue. The patient's been worked up for problems with the adrenal gland and, and other problems. Can't figure it out. 95% of people have primary hypertension. Secondary hypertension means there's a reason for it. Maybe it's a tumor in the adrenal gland, and the adrenal gland is over-secreting aldosterone. And we know that, of course, that aldosterone causes the reabsorption of salt and water, uh, which is going to increase your blood pressure. Turbulent blood flow caused by an aneurysm uh, can also injure downstream endothelial cells. Uh, so a tumor pressing into the blood vessel wall, like putting your finger over a hose, right? We said that the water goes crazy initially, uh, and that can damage that spray from, from the lumen being stenosed, uh, can damage the walls of the endothelial cells. Vasculitis can do it as well, and arterial sclerosis can do it as well. Uh, vessel wall inflammation. Uh, can do it from myocardial infarction, will 
will injure the blood vessels because an inflammation occurs to clean up the dead myocardial tissue, and that can spill into the endothelial cells and injure them. Uh, vasculitis is just already an inflammation of the endothelial cells, which upsets them. A catheter, you're having an angioplasty, and the catheter uh, bangs into cells, uh, bangs into the endothelium and, and physically damages them. Some bacterial endotoxins can spark a vasculitis, which can also injure endothelial cells. So all these can upset the endothelial cells. Radiation therapy for cancer. Um, some metabolic abnormalities like hyperhomocysteinemia or hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia, um, they can all injure endothelial cells. These two via the process of atherosclerosis. Who cares? Who cares if the endothelial cells tell them to get over it, right? Well, the endothelial cells don't get over it. They respond in a weird way. Um, they, when they get upset, they overproduce things that they're not supposed to overproduce, and they underproduce things that they're supposed to produce, protective substances. Um, so that is not, not cool. And there's a theory that still holds today called the response to injury theory that gives us an explanation of how damaged endothelial cells uh, can cause deadly athero or deadly arterial thrombi or embolisms. And this is called the response to injury theory. And basically the response to injury theory means the endothelial cells get injured or inflamed. And what's the response to that injury or inflammation? They overproduce bad things and they underproduce bad things, all of which increase the chances of blood clots or thrombosis in the artery, which is very dangerous. And that and again, the thrombus can break loose and flow downstream as an embolism and cause all kinds of, go up in the brain and cause a stroke, can go into the heart and cause a heart attack, cause all kinds of trouble. Okay, so what is overproduced and what is underproduced? So endothelial cell injury overproduces uh, some prothrombogenic molecules. So these are molecules that stimulate the blood to clot, like von Willebrand factors overproduced. Uh, and a PAI, plasminogen activator inhibitor. Uh, what does that do? If it, that shuts off, one of the slippery three, tissue plasminogen activator, is shut off. TPA is shut off via two mechanisms, as we'll see. Um, and we need that to prevent blood clotting. All right, so von, Willi, von Willebrand factor, we'll learn more about that later. Uh, but that causes blood clotting as well if that level is elevated. And then it underproduces some things. So this is an anti-thrombogenic uh, molecules are, are underproduced. Uh, and th they are the slippery three. We need those slippery three to prevent blood clots. And so thrombomodulin, tissue, plasminogen activator, and our friend prostacyclin are all underproduced by an inflamed and irritated and upset endothelial cell. Both of these conditions... Uh, lead to death. It can be very bad. Both of these conditions can lead to the deadly arterial thrombus and the dead, even more deadly arterial embolism. Can epithelial cells regulate the flow of blood? Absolutely. How? By releasing vasoconstrictors and vasodilators, uh, which can soak the, at least releasing these internally, not into the bloodstream so much. Uh, they're released internally, and they soak into the tunica media, and they can cause relaxation or contraction of the tunica media. If the muscles of the tunica media contract, that narrows the, flow, the, the lumen of the blood vessel, and that narrows or reduces the flow of blood through that narrowed lumen. If the tunica media of the smooth muscle relax, or I could say if the, if the tunica media relaxes, the lumen or the barrel of the blood vessel gets bigger. It dilates. It vasodilates. And that allows more blood to flow. See how that works. All right, so the king of the vasodilators is nitric oxide. So I always, if I would be standing in front of you, I would take my fingers and make a big O with my thumb and fingers. O, 
nitric oxide, NO, the O means open. Nitric oxide means open or OK. Be careful with, <clears throat> or ick means ick, I hate this stuff, because I'm trying to make you remember the difference between nitric oxide and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is not released by endothelial cells. In fact, it's the laughing gas, or that's the stuff that the dentists use, or a different form of it can be used as drag racing fuel. So don't be hilarious, us, nitrous, hilarious. Don't be hilarious and get these two wrong. Nitrous, hilarious, nitrous oxide is not have anything to do with endothelial cells. Nitric oxide, not nitric oxide uh, diffuses into the tunica media and causes the tunica media muscles to relax, and that opens up the barrel of the blood vessel and causes the blood to flow better. So there's a yin and yang, nitric oxide versus sympathetic tiger. Uh, so sympathetics, which come out of the vasomotor center of the medulla, like a tiger coming out of a cage, uh, they, they are a powerful vasoconstrictor. And there's always a little tiger coming out of your vasomotor center at all times. So your blood vessels throughout your body are in a constant state of narrowing because of that sympathetic tiger. On the other hand, nitric oxide is being released into the tunica media all the time, and that's causing the barrel of the artery to open up or vasodilation. So you get a yin and yang. You get two opposing effects, and therefore your blood vessels are kind of medium, mediumly dilated right now. And, and that's the kind of the yin and yang between the nitric oxide and the sympathetic tiger. So nitric oxide opposes the vessel's natural tendency to vasoconstrict. See how that works? All right, nitric oxide versus shear force. So, oh, I did something fancy, didn't I? That's pretty cool. What normally stimulates the release of nitric oxide? It's actually the scraping uh, of blood over the blood vessel walls. Who are the blood vessel walls? Well, those are the endothelial cells. So it's the flow of blood kind of scraping against the blood vessel walls that stimulates them to constantly release nitric oxide. Uh, the more, the harder the blood scrapes over the walls of the, the artery, the more nitric oxide is released. So what increases that scraping force? And I shouldn't call it scraping force, but that's what it is. What increases the shear force or the shear stress on a blood vessel wall? Well, anything that increases the speed of the blood flowing through the arteries, like hypertension. So hypertension, when it first starts, causes an increased release of nitric oxide, which combats the hypertension by increasing the luminal diameter, which is going to decrease the velocity and decrease the blood pressure. So you think, well, great, how can people have hypertension then? Won't nitric oxide just be released more and more so there is no hypertension? Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work like that. That mechanism can get burned out. You can't release nitric oxide full power like that all the time. And so eventually, nitric oxide levels will decrease and the hypertension will win. And the endothelial cells kind of reset themselves uh, to if the temperature if the pressure goes even higher then they'll release again uh, but yeah the horses run wild the hypertension will eventually w run wild because nitric oxide can't uh, control that the natriuretic system can also try to fight off hypertension but the same thing it it can't often can't uh, do it all right what are two popular medications that involve nitric oxide. And here's Mr. Bill. If you don't know who Mr. Bill is, he was a famous Saturday Night Live character, a little cartoon. You can Google him. There's all sorts of old Mr. Bill videos. They're probably not politically correct in this day and age, but they sure were funny back when I was in probably high school. So, But we can use the Mr. Bill face. Let's look what we can do with that. Oh, look, it's the penis. So it always reminds me of Mr. Bill. 
But let's, revi let's review our anatomy of the penis because we're going to talk about erections now. So remember the penis has two big chambers called corpora cavernosa is plural. Corpus cavernosum would be singular if you're talking about one. Corpora cavernosa is plural. And then there's a little chamber that doesn't do that much here. That's the corpus spongiosum. There's only one of those. And these, of course, are filled by a microcirculation of cavernosal uh, arterioles and venules and capillaries, just like any tissue is. Okay, so what causes an erection? It's nitric oxide. So nitric oxide can be released uh, via parasympathetic stimulation via the pudendal nerve, but nitric oxide is released from two sources. Of course, the endothelial cells, we already know that, specifically the, the corpora cavernosal artery and arterioles. And this one you don't know, the corpora cavernosal nerve endings can also release nitric oxide directly, uh, and these live in the tunica media of these cavernosal vessels, and they can release uh, they can release nitric oxide and it can soak immediately in to the tunica media. So tunica media gets hit from nitric oxide coming from the, from the inner lining of the blood vessel, the tunica intima, and from the outer lining of the blood vessel, the tunica adventitia. So it gets bombed with nitric oxide. What does nitric oxide do inside the smooth muscle? Well, it increases the blood flow through the corpora cavernosal capillary and microcirculation, which is going to increase hydrostatic pressure within the capillaries. We're going to explain this more in a second. Bottom line uh, is the increased hydrostatic pressure allows blood fluid to pour out into the, into the cavernosum, and they fill with blood fluid like interstitial fluid, and the penis gets hard because of that. But let's go into that a little more deeply so we can understand how that works, this erection works, because we got to go a little deeper. Cyclic GMP is the erection maker. So let's see how this works. So once nitric oxide gets inside the tunica media of smooth muscle cells, it looks for its receptor, uh, who happens to be on an enzyme called guanylyl cyclase. Um, and it binds to, so, so nitric oxide binds to guanylyl cyclase. Great. So that's an enzyme. So what does that enzyme do? Well, it wakes up and it takes, uh, it creates a molecule called cyclic or cyclic GMP, a.k.a. CGMP, a.k.a. cyclic guanosine monophosphate. Um, and who's the substrate is is guanine triphosphate GTP. Let's look at a picture. These work better sometimes. So here is a here is a corpora cavernosal artery in one of the corpora cavernosum. Right? So nitric oxide is being released from the endothelial cells and from the nerve endings in the tunic adventitia. And it's flooding in to the smooth muscle cells. And remember, this is a blood vessel. We have blood. Uh, blood would be flowing through here. And this is the wall of the blood vessel here. Okay, so in the middle of the wall, of course, is where the smooth muscle lives, which has the ability to control the lumen of this blood vessel. Right, so nitric oxide binds to guanylyl cyclase and stimulates it to do its job. What is the job of guanylyl cyclase? To take GTP and convert it into cyclic GMP. Simple as that. So we got cyclic GMP. What does cyclic GMP then do? Um, it's it by itself it can't cause any any contraction of the tunica media. So cyclic GMP binds to its target, uh, which is called PKG, protein kinase G. So the newly created cyclic GMP binds to PKG, okay, and it wakes up PKG. What does PKG do? PKG, through mechanisms we won't get any deeper than that, PKG is inside the, the smooth muscle cell, 
and it kicks calcium ion out. It stimulates a mechanism, which we won't worry about. It kicks calcium out of the smooth muscle. If a smooth muscle doesn't have calcium, what happens? Well, you need calcium to cause a contraction, right? So it's going to relax. Okay, so let's look. Let's review. Nitric oxide comes in, binds to guanylyl cyclase. Um, that stimulates it to do its job. What's guanylyl cyclase job? Take GTP and convert it into cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP now binds to PKG and stimulates it. Uh, and PKG, through mechanisms we won't worry about, causes all the calcium inside this smooth muscle cell to get out. And again, Without calcium around, the actin and myosin filaments can't contract, so they relax. Smooth muscle relaxes, and you get a massive vasodilation uh, of the arterioles. We know that arterioles are connected to capillaries. If you get a massive vasodilation of the arterioles, what's going to happen to the pressure inside the capillary? It's going to go up like crazy, and it overpressurizes the capillaries. And so that so much hydrostatic pressure just causes the blood fluid to pour out of the cavernosa capillaries into the interstitium, uh, and it fills up the corpora cavernosa, and uh, an erection occurs. And that's all there is to that. As the erection occurs, it also pinches off the veins that drain the penis. And so the blood fluid in the corpora cavernosa can't even get out to drain out, so it perpetuates the erection. All right? Now, so you got an erection. How does the erection stop? So the erection stopper is PDE5, which is stands for cyclic GMP-specific phosphodiesterase 5. Let's just call it PDE5, shall we? Um, so normally, cyclic GMP eventually runs into PD-5 and they bind together. PD-5 deactivates cyclic GMP and without cyclic GMP, PKG is no longer activated and without PKG activated inside the smooth muscle cell, you can't kick calcium out anymore. So calcium comes pouring back in the smooth muscle cell and when calcium comes back in, you can get actin and myosin contracting you get a vasoconstriction, and that's, that re-establishes normal hydrostatic pressure within the capillaries. Um, and so the capillaries no longer are leaking interstitial fluid into the corpus cavernosa, and some of that interstitial fluid is now able to be drained away uh, by the vein starts to open up. The distal capillary starts siphoning off some of that interstitial fluid, and the erection is over. So PD-5 is the erection stopper. Let's look at it again. So here's PD-5 running around, and it finds cyclic GMP and binds to it and shuts that down. Without cyclic GMP, PKG won't work. Without PKG on, there's nothing to kick calcium out of the cell, so calcium pours back in. The cell contracts. The lumen decreases in size. Uh, and the proper blood flow now goes through the capillaries, and the distal capillary now sucks the, the interstitial fluid out of the corporate cavernosa and back into the uh, venous system, and the erection decreases. Great. Now, let's talk about old people, old men. Once you get over 50, I guess you're old. So old men don't produce nitric oxide. Actually, starting in the 40s, the levels, the ability of endothelial cells to make nitric oxide decreases steadily. Uh, and therefore, it gets tougher and tougher for men to have an erection because you have to be able to release nitric oxide to have an erection. No nitric oxide, the whole principle is broken down. We won't go through it again. So what's the aging male to do? Of course, we probably know the answer, the little blue pill. Uh, so sildenafil or Viagra uh, was kind of off-label use for this, right? It wasn't even designed to lower your blood pressure, but they found that it uh, caused erections. So that's what it works. So how, what's the story with, 
with sildenafil. How does that how does that work? So sildenafil, we just call it Viagra, inhibits PD5. It's the PD5 inhibitor. So you take Viagra, it gets into the bloodstream, it diffuses to all the tunica media of cells all over the body, including the heart. Uh, but it finds PD5 and binds to it and deactivates PD5. Where does PD5 live? So we're talking about the smooth muscle cells uh, within the arterioles of the corpora cavernosa. So it deactivates PD5. We said PD5 is the erection stopper, right? Um, so no P, so PD5 can no longer deactivate. It can't do its job. It can't deactivate cyclic GMP. And so now cyclic GMP can stay alive much longer than it used to. Uh, and therefore, and therefore the, the erection will work. It takes a little while. It takes about 60 minutes uh, for guys to get an erection uh, who are taking Viagra. It doesn't happen right away because the Viagra doesn't, doesn't, do anything it doesn't kick the calcium out of the smooth muscle cell all it does is deactivate pd5 and that means cyclic gmp is alive a much longer than it normally is and men can usually make at least a little nitric oxide so it may take a while but the nitric oxide then uh, can go through the whole process and um, kick the kick the calcium out of the smooth muscle cell. Okay, so therefore Viagra indirectly inhibits the breakdown of cyclic GMP by blocking the action of PD5. I do like these words directly and indirectly on my testing. So make sure you know the difference between that, directly versus indirectly. Okay, so it indirectly inhibits the breakdown of cyclic GMP uh, because it doesn't touch cyclic GMP. Um, it in, it touches PD5, so therefore its effect on cyclic GMP is indirect. So the older male will get an erection. It just takes about 60 minutes or so. Right, so go back to our cartoon. So the blood's flowing through here, um, and this is the wall of the blood vessel, just a piece of it, smooth muscle cells. And now we have Viagra binding to PD5 and blocking that. So PD5, the erection turner offer, um, can't shut off psychic GMP. Psychic GMP can bind to PKG, uh, stimulate PKG to kick calcium out of the cell. And therefore, this will relax and you get a vasodilation. See how that works? What about young men who take Viagra? Is that a good thing? You're playing with fire if young guys are taking Viagra. The problem is that they will get an they can get an erection without viagra but if they take viagra and it blocks pd5 the reaction the erection can stay for hours and hours thank you very much for that um and when you go over about four hours if you have an erection for more than four hours uh, the penis can start to die the you can get tissue ischemia and you can get pain and that's there's a name for that condition when erection goes over five hours. Uh, it's called priapism. And this is and this type of priapism is called ischemic priapism um, because the Viagra is not letting PD5 do its job. And they'll have to go, you have to go to the emergency room, they'll have to take a syringe and stick it in your erection and drain the fluid right out of it uh, in attempts to save the penis in some people's Penis have gotten necrotic and they'd have to have to amputate it. Um, so don't play around with Viagra. You're playing with fire. Also, kind of a fact: people with sickle cell anemia tend to have this even without the Viagra. They have trouble with priapism as well. We won't get into that mechanism. Just don't have time. All right. So I think that's about it. Um, the bird for CVPP today is a very common bird. You can see when you go to uh, the ocean or lakes that or rivers that feed the ocean. This is called a, I don't know why they call it a buffalo head, like a buffalo, but this is the male buffalo head duck. The females are more plain looking. 
um, but it kind of glows in the pretty colors, like a hummingbird almost when the light hits it. Uh, so there's your bird for the day, male bufflehead. See you guys in the next lecture. Email me those questions if you have any questions about anything. Send me those emails. I haven't gotten any yet, but it's only week one. See you later.